You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special and unique episode, bonus episode of Common Descent. Yeah, first one of its kind so far. This is a compilation of mini episodes that we recorded for our patrons of a specific level. So one of the things that our patrons can get at the highest level of patronage on our Patreon, one of the rewards is we will record a mini episode just for you on a subject of your choosing. Now, the, the the idea is you name an animal or a group of animals, and we'll do a little discussion about it. Yeah, just kind of an impromptu delve into that group or creature. Right. Not a ton of background research, just mostly our thoughts and what we know about the thing. Because that's something that we can do without too much trouble, mm-hmm. and it's a fun little reward that we can give to our patrons. Well, we've done five of them. Yes. And everyone's stuck inside looking for things to occupy their time. And so those two factors made us think that this was a good time to release them as a compilation. Yeah. So in the rest of this audio, you will hear five recordings, five little discussions about five topics for five of our top level patrons. Before we get to it, here's a little quick intro to what you're going to hear. The first one is a mini episode for Julie about an animal called Desmatosuchus. Yeah. Which is, as Will is very excited, a croc cousin, an edosaur, those armored... Yeah, armored uh, herbivorous croc cousin. The crocodilomorph answer to ankylosaurs. Yes. The second is about the dinosaur called Stiggy Moloch. Yeah. One of the dome-headed kind of with the spikes around it bipedal dinosaurs for Danielle... Those two are the two first ones we did, and you will hear the quality difference. Yes, <laughs> in yeah, the very recordings. true. <laughs> when I was editing through it again, yeah, you can hear that quality <laughs> difference. <laughs> the third one is about cryptobranchids, giant salamanders. Yeah. For Michael, you will also hear uh, a bit of a quality shift in that one, because we recorded it at the Gray Fossil Site Museum. And then we did one about parrots for Beth. Mm-hmm. And finally, one of the, the, the weirdest of them, <laughs> one of our patrons, Barbara, decided instead of choosing an animal to ask us to do a mini speculative evolution episode about graboids. Which we acquiesced to that request. And it's a convenient timing because we also just released our Silver Screen Science about yeah. tremors. So if you don't know what graboids are, go listen to that Silver Screen Science and then come back and listen to our mini Graboids episode for Barbara. A minor warning for that last recording. There are spoilers, yes. minor spoilers, for the Tremors of the movie. And we quote a couple things from the movie that count as minor swears. Yeah, it's quotes for posterity, but the right. movie... Swear, so. so like PG-13, it gets in that last audio for anybody out there who that, that's important to you. Also minor spoilers for the other movies and... Oh, in I, the Tremors franchise, that's Yeah, true. in the Tremors franchise. And I don't remember if we touch on the show much, but maybe spoilers for that. So just yeah. be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but without further ado, enjoy these mini episodes, this anthology of patron mini episodes. And thank you to all of our patrons. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our listeners. We hope everybody is staying safe and healthy out there. And we hope that this helps you pass some more of the time while we wait out our current global crisis. Yeah, we hope you all enjoy. We had a lot of fun making these. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, Julie. Hi. Welcome to your very own Common Descent mini episode. As you, you well know, just for you, because you're so special to us, because you give us lots of money on Patreon, and we are very appreciative. And, and you know what? We feel that's just a, a, a real neighborly thing to do. You have requested that we talk about Desmatosuchus, which is a really good request. Oh, good. Boy. 
taste. Good choice. I know Will's excited. Absolutely, I am. Talk about it. One of them pseudo Sukians. Oh, they're so cool. They're such a cool, weird group. They are. So yeah, we let we'll just jump right in, have a little conversation. As Julie, I'm sure you already know, these are armored uh pseudo Sukian crocodilla morphs broad broad croc categorization. Yeah, so it's uh, you, you of get, the group Adasaur. Yeah. Th- this is in the same group that includes the pseudo crocodilla morphs. So like we're just above what we're starting to be willing to call croc stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but very but rather croc like in many ways. Yeah. What what do you like about Desmatasuchus, Will? So the there's two cool things that jump out to me with uh the Adasaurs in general, but especially Desmatasuchus, because it, it's kind of the the big brother of the Adasaurs. Cause it's yeah, it's sort of the poster child. Yeah. In the same way that like there are a lot of tyrannosaurs, but there is one that you know because it's yes. the best known and it's the biggest. Yeah, uh, that goes for Desmatosuchus. It's the the biggest, at least as far as we know, of the Adasaurs. And they were all these terrestrial, armored, herbivorous, uh, distant croc cousins that very much have a parallel to your ankylosaurs, which is really cool. Even morphologically, I I was finding when doing my my bits of research. They have a lot of similarities in their um, skeletal and uh, skull structures and share a lot of features with those armored dinosaurs, which is cool. Yeah, they're well, it's fun because the Triassic repeatedly shows itself to have been a time where reptiles were experimenting with many of the things that would later become big deals with dinosaurs. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, you see very similar designs popping up. I love herbivorous uh sukians because for a group that is so often characterized by its carnivorous groups there were these herbivorous uh lumbering armored individuals which i love personally because it means you could have had an ecosystem of just pseudo sukians <laughs> every and they, niche yeah they would have filled it out <laughs> Well, it's fun because one of the things that's really interesting comparing them to crocs is that because you look at armored animals like ankylosaurs were often very wide bodied and turtles are wide bodied and armadillos are kind of round. But Desmatosuchus, when you look at the whole body, it's still very croc shaped. It is. It's long and narrow. It's much more upright than our our today crocs. They they have that. They're parasagital. Mm hmm. But they, yeah, it has, it looks like a very tall, you know, pig snouted croc, uh, with extra armor, you know, cause these, these would have those lateral facing spikes over the shoulders, just sticking out like up to a foot long. Yes. Which is an impressive spike. Yeah. Like that's significant. And my, this is one of my favorite things about them. They have such a weird little face. The little pig snout. Little weird shovel nosed pig snout. Like a hog nosed snake. It, yes. Oh, that's exactly what it looks like. It's a and it's adorable. Snake. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's it's you can see it snuffling around, you know, for food. And that's the oh, that's that's such a mismatch <laughs> from other pseudo sushians like uh the the big predatory guys walking around that had your classic archosaur predator face. And so it's cool to see that variety of like a really divergent morphology. I've seen some references relate Desmatosuchus to a pig, that they were wondering if it was eating kind of like a pig, you know, like digging up roots and stuff. Actually pushing through the dirt with that snout. It's also something that face shape is something you see in armadillos. Yes, that's something I noticed. No teeth at the front, upturned snout. Armor, obviously, even pro- maybe not digging arms, but powerful front arms. Yes. That they may be, you know, digging for stuff. I've even seen some some authors have apparently suggested that they may have been more omnivorous. Yeah, like like taking grubs and bugs and stuff like an armadillo if they got the chance. Just by comparison with armadillos and pigs. We're like, yeah, it's sort of a similar shape. And which would make complete sense. They They've got those just very simple peg-like teeth that would be great for grinding up a lot of stuff really like they're not 
obviously super specialized for grinding through vegetation or slicing up meat. So yeah, you could see them, especially if they were like grabbing an egg or grabbing a bug or worm or something or yeah, it's whatever arthropods. Was around. Yeah. Which is another way that they're similar to ankylosaurs. That's very simple teeth. Yes. You know, small head, simple teeth was a very ankylosaurian thing to have. Trends like that always intrigue me because that's if you asked someone, all right, we have two ancient armored reptiles, both plant eaters. What similarities do you think they might have? Simple teeth is not what would jump to my head. No, it seems like a very specialized lifestyle. Yeah, those are weird parallels, which is interesting, but baffling. One other neat thing I found when going through uh, a couple of sources is evidently there's a semi-decent amount of evidence that they were at least somewhat social, that they traveled and lived in small groups because oh. they have multiple times been found. Uh, the fossils have been found in small grouped collections in very tight areas. Interesting. Yeah, suggesting that they died together. So they may have been roaming around in little uh, Atosaur herds, little Dematosuchus herds. Which is also a weird... I mean, you know, granted, they're very distantly related to modern crocs. So yes. comparing them directly is not a great thing to do. But also very unexpected herding herbivorous crocs. Yeah. So, I, And I wonder if it was, are you actually herding or are you doing the thing that crocs do today where you just are all hanging around the same spot because that's where the food is or some such? Yeah, it's... It's one of those interesting notes where are you are you a herd or do you just all decide to live together? Because there's a difference between being in a herd where you actually uh, uh, coordinate with one another. Right. Versus tolerating each other. Yeah. There it's like, all right, we'll all eat together because, hey, when post Asuka shows up, you guys <laughs> might get eaten before me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like – Alligators don't care. That's the way I always describe it to people at the aquarium when they're like, so are alligators social? They're like, more than you might think, but not in the way you probably think. If I go into a pond and wrangle an alligator, none of the other alligators come to its help, nor do they miss it. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it's what we call gregarious. They're just grouping, but they're not, you know, and I could absolutely picture that with these browsing guys just huddling together, you know, maybe just kind of, staying nearby because they feel more comfortable, but maybe not actually socializing or anything. Uh, and speaking of those things, uh, the thing that Julie, that you, Julie, brought up in your message was those spikes. Yeah. So they've got that. And it's such a weird arrangement because ankylosaurs have like knobs and spikes all over the back. Oh, yeah. Whereas Desmatosuchus has that, those wing spikes running, that, that line that runs over the shoulder and I, it's it's been suggested, of course, that they're anti-predatory. Yep. That, yes, you are protecting yourself from them. And the shoulder, like the neck to shoulder region, I would think has a lot of mobility. Yeah, and you see you see a prominent, similar-esque spikes show up in certain, certain stegosaurs and ankylosaurs in the same region, that they get those shoulder spines. Yes, I was going to bring that up because I've actually gotten to work a little bit with oh, yeah, ankylosaur shoulder spikes. Uh, when I was up in New York, I worked at Mike Demick's lab and he had Soropelta, which is a nodosaur, which was an ankylosaur, fairly, you know, lightly armored as ankylosaurs go, but had these shoulder spikes. And these were, you know, no offense to Desmatosuchus. <laughs> these put Desmatosuchus to shame. These were like... <laughs> these aren't your Atosaur spikes. No, these ain't your Grand Crocky's spikes. They're like three feet long. Yeah, ridiculous. But they were... The, the front edge of them was really thin. And you could easily picture it just clotheslining something like that. They, they were nasty. You know, for, it wasn't just like a poking spike. Yeah, it was... It, it was, was sharp-edged. An anime ankylosaur with these ridiculous ridiculous <laughs> swing watch <laughs> it would run past its opponent and there'd be a big blue streak and then it would pause and its opponent would fall down behind it <laughs> two pieces so obviously uh spot lateral spines are nice for 
uh, fending off predators. I've also seen it suggested that they were sexual display, which would not surprise me at all because everything weird is, you know, that's a, a logical conclusion is, yep. yeah, maybe it's also showing off. And I think part of one of the things that uh, quote unquote maybe supports kind of is there has been suggestions of sexual dimorphism because evidently there's a lot of variation within Dematosuchus of the size of the spines that different individuals can have wildly varying sizes and lengths. Uh-huh. I was also going to point out that different edosaurs have different arrangements of Absolutely. armor, which is also a point in the favor of, yeah, we're just differentiating males or all individuals of different species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like the the news we talked about with the, the ceratopsian frills as to whether or not it was Species recognition. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But yeah, so if if it is sexually dimorphic, which is almost nigh on impossible in many animals to confirm because the bits are gone. But if that is the case, it would absolutely make sense that males might have these big, pretty display spines if the males are the one displaying. Some animals, females display, so who knows? I wonder how much of a sheath there would have been. Yeah, was there a, a horny keratin or covering over the spine? Because in Triceratops and such, the horn is a lot longer than the bone core that we find in fossils. Just like, you know, rams and bison and such. So I wonder if these had that. I wonder if they they would have been actually even longer than that. Yeah. And if and if that's the case, who knows? You know, because if you look at the horn core for like some of the antelopes, it's not at all the shape of their crazy kooky horns. So like nope. they could have really weird stuff going on if they did have a a horn sheath over those spines, which actually could make sense. I saw one thing that suggested that there's evidence they had a a horny beak like covering yes. over that snout. So in the, in the face. If you have that there, there's no reason you couldn't have a similar thing on your back. Come to think of it, I don't know that I could picture them clotheslining anything. Because they had rows of spike. It was like a row. But man, that would be a formidable, like, like what are they, uh, punji sticks? Yes, 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 <laughs> you, exactly. Like, put outside. And that's like, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the size of Postosuchus, big Rawasuki and Predator Crocs, compared to Edosaurs. But that's going to be face or chest level. Absolutely. So that if you aim your shoulders at your Predator... They have to either bite around or bite over those spikes. So that that actually would work out very well. Let's see. We have the internet. We do. How? Listed at four to five meters in length, and I think I saw another thing that said, yeah, about four feet tall. And okay, so the similar thing I found to is yeah. So they'd be basically the same size because Dematosuchus is like four and a half meters long. So, so you just stick your spikes in its face. Yeah, you just you'd be right at eye level. Yeah, all you have to do is pivot while while Postosuchus has to like navigate around you. Now, that being said, there is like skeletal elements that show f- feeding patterns from Postosuchus very likely. So, it didn't it, work all the time. It, it only worked enough, <laughs> <laughs> so it seems, for them to make it to the end of the Triassic. A couple other things that I like about Desmatosuchus, little things. One is another similarity with ankylosaurs and such. There's a lot of bone fusion across Desmatosuchus. That there's this is something you see a lot of animals that are trying to strengthen their skeleton will fuse bones. So like in birds, birds are a great example. Like whole sections of the vertebral column are fused into single elements. Yep. Rigid elements. And I as soon as I started reading about Desmatosuchus, I was like, I wonder if Desmatosuchus has that. And yes, I found a paper that talked about fusion in the brain case, in the hips, and in the shoulder girdle. Very cool. To strengthen and rigidify those areas, which is a lot of fun. Which makes, I mean, makes perfect sense. Like, that's, it's why we have a big solid brain case, because we've got a brain, a big brain needing protecting. Yeah. So, get rid of those wiggly gaps. Fuse it all together. Ankylosaurs have a lot of fusion. Uh, Most famously, in the tail. Yes, absolutely. The tail of ankylosaurs is all fused up, because that's. You, it needs to be a battering ram. Oh, yeah, it's literally a club. It, you, yes. like If you were big enough, you could have picked it up like a mace. Yes. Ooh, oh, man. There's some... Somewhere there's a fantasy to be written about... Yeah, uh, right? Giants in the time of 
the dinosaurs wielding ankylosaur tails as clubs. There's there's a, a encounter for our, our paleo D&D game. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I find really endearing about Desmatosuchus is that the most common fossil remains are its scutes. Yeah. It's armor bits, which I love because that was also true of my thesis lizard. <laughs> like a lot of this is true of a lot of animals that have osteoderms. Yes. Right. Osteoderms are bones that grow within the skin in ankylosaurs and in desmatosuchans. That's what those things. That's what that armor is. Same thing with crocs. Crocodiles and alligators today have that. And it becomes very common. Croc scutes and glass lizard and skink osteoderms are very common in the fossil record because one individual, right, like your one croc is going to have, you know, 200 bones or, so, or or whatnot, but hundreds of osteoderms and just leaving them about behind everywhere. Oh, and it's, it's also cool because that means that they they could be all bumpy and armored just all over the place. And uh, I, I love trying to picture in detail how these animals would have actually looked with all of these, all the bits in place, all the osteoderms, because uh, some of these guys have a lot and they're really complex. It's they're cool, cool animals, cool looking animals. They're very fun. They're among the earliest archosaur herbivores. In fact, they would have been among the earliest dominant herbivores on land. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, and definitely they they got big enough to establish themselves as the the big herbivores and so I, once again but for a flip of the coin we could have had <laughs> these roaming around i mean just picturing these the, at the size of ankylosaurs just oh my goodness multi ton juggernauts would have been so cool they're just a fascinating, it really is, a fa my favorite thing about the Eudosaurs is that they spark this conversation about convergent evolution. Yeah. That a large armored herbivore is just a good thing to be. And it's so fun because it's one of those things that is extremely common in the fossil record, but we just don't have it today. Yeah, exactly. Like there have been, we have a croc lineage version of it a dinosaurian lineage of it. We have a mammalian lineage in the glyptodonts yep, of it. The glyptodonts and, and the giant armadillos. And yeah, so like the Ice Age. we have multiple versions of I'm going to put bones on the outside of my body and I'm going to get bulky. I'm going to eat plants and no one's going to mess with me. Yep. Not to mention turtles. Yes. Which have done Absolutely. the same. Well, turtles are, are a whole other Turtles are ridiculous. Yes. Turtles said, all right, I like the first part, but how about then we do whatever we want? What if <laughs> instead of growing... See, you're all growing new bones. Yes. We're just going to take our ribs and put them on the outside instead of on the inside. And all the other animals were like, it'll never work. <laughs> well... <sighs> so yeah, it's just a fat... Well, the only reason we don't have that around today is because we are on the the leeward end. side of a extinction event. Yeah. We lost our glyptodons. Well, and actually comparing to those other animals, I wonder why does I, I expect as Matasukians, uh, Edosaurs to have had tail clubs. Yeah. Yeah. Glyptodons had them. Ankylosaurs had them. I wonder if there's, there was a, a Victoria Arbor and friends just did a study recently, or I think are still working on a study of, why why tail clubs come about and and how different lineages have evolved tail clubs over time yeah why is it a structure you see pop up over and over but it is not like just everywhere yeah because it, it pops up in very specific situations so i yeah i do i wonder why desmatosuchus desmatosuchus and friends did not have them yeah uh, if they were you know, did they have any sort of thing that they used in place of that? Was it just the spines or it's, I mean, cause there's also the point that it could be bluffing. You know, there's, there's an aspect to that, that those big spines could just hopefully scare off, look scary enough. They may have been, yeah, that maybe they weren't actually strong enough to ward anything off. It's just don't get too close. Is that, yeah. And it keeps, you know, all but the biggest post Asukas away. Uh, so like, there's a lot of things with the behavior of this animal that uh, are interesting and, and unknown. 
but they're they're such so weird compared to the rest of the lineage that they really stick out yes very cool animals lots of mysteries hopefully more to come <gasps> julie thank you so much for requesting this yeah this was this a was lot a, of fun this was a really fun one it's 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 nice to give some appreciation to these guys yeah these, these... you get, get to jump into a spe- a very specific group for a little bit yeah well we hope you've enjoyed your own personal micro episode Thank you again for requesting it. Thank you again for all of your support. You're awesome. We hope you will continue to listen and support us in the future. And that's it for now. I think I, th- I think now we will sign off with our signature lack of a sign-off plan. Thank you genuinely and ta-ta. Music! Bum, bum. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Welcome to your very own episode of The Common Descent. Just for you, your own little micro-episode. Of course, first and foremost, thank you so much for your contributions on Patreon. Yes. Those are amazing. So, you you said your favorite animal uh, was Stiggy Moloch, which is a really cool one. Yeah, and so it we, is. We we did a little research, did a little digging, uh, not actual digging for Stiggy Moloch. That'd be awesome, but internet digging. <laughs> you got it. That's that's another Patreon level. <laughs> yes, yes. We we have we, this we... skull here, and <laughs> just for you, we signed it. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're here to talk about this really cool dinosaur. Yeah, talk about some of the reasons that we agree with you that it's really cool. I've I've always liked Pachycephalosaurus. Just because they they showed up in really neat places when I was a kid, and so they I don't know, they they hold a place in my childhood memory. The the thing so the first thing I always think of them is there's it's two connections to Jurassic Park because mm-hmm. they show up in Lost World. You know, yep. They have the big scene where they're catching one, and they have the wonderful. I and I I still to this day find it hilarious moment where as the paleontologist that's with them is describing how the Pachycephalosaur head ram yeah. works, it punches a guy through a jeep. <laughs> yep. I I still find that I still laugh at that moment to today. <laughs> but then they also like they had a really great toy that came with that that run of the movie. Was it the one that had the button and it would yeah. lower its head? It had a little yeah, button on his hip that. and he would tip his head forward so that he could punch stuff and I would sit there and punch things over. I'd knock like toilet paper tubes over. Oh yeah. I to- I re- I forgot that that existed until literally you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. It. And he had his hands like down like his hands were down so it looked like he was like throwing himself forward yeah but they were just in this weird like finger splayed out as if he's getting a manicure pose <laughs> like <laughs> like i remember i still have this toy but i remember it vividly uh Ooh. so these uh, these dinosaurs have always had a uh a neat place in my heart for me one of my favorite things and i i, I there was a time where this was information that i just discovered but it mm-hmm. still is a fun I, you know, it, it kind of sticks out as one of those, I remember being super excited when I learned it. Yes. And that was the taxonomic placement of pachycephalosaurs. And they yeah. belong to the big group of dinosaurs called marginocephalians, which is pachycephalosaurs and ceratopsians. And what they share is that ornamentation around the back of the skull. The mm-hmm. Triceratops and friends have those big frills, and the Pachycephalosaurs have all those spikes and knobs and, and hooks and stuff. Yeah. That they're part of a vast category of dinosaurs that have cranial orient- ornamentation, and the Pachycephalosaurs are the alternative to the frills and horns of Ceratopsians. Which is re- that's really cool whenever that happens in a group of animals to where there's like a trend between them all having a feature and them all yeah. using it either slightly differently or going in different ways on how it's grown. And I like that. You know, it's you if you put those skulls next to each other, your gut reaction wouldn't be, oh, those are related. Yep. <laughs> but but as soon as you realize, oh, the same bones are producing these yeah these variations on a theme. It's really cool. And so uh, on the note of their head, one of the things that you got to talk about when you talk about pach- pachycephalosaurs is the the use of that dome. Because that's been debated and a bit of a mystery. And 
you know, an, a subject of contention among some for a long time. Oh yeah, for as long as we've known about their heads. Because it's, it's an extreme feature, and we don't have any animal today that has something quite like it. Like, you know, you get rams yeah. that have little domed spots where the horns are actually impacting in between each other and mm -hmm. things like that. But you don't have anything that just literally has like a cereal bowl on its head. Yes, <laughs> surrounded by spikes and knobs. And it was it was fairly early on that like it was just kind of suggested that they were using this as maybe a, a battering ram, either for mm -hmm. defense or intraspecific competition. Yeah, like bison and, and mm -hmm. goats and stuff. And I was I was mentioning to David just beforehand, I found out that there was a, a really old sci fi book or just short story called A Gun for Dinosaur, which drew from that suggestion and had it's about a time travelers that go back and safari hunt dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, of course. As you it, do. Yeah. Like of course. That's <laughs> it's one of those things we think about if we had a time machine, the scientific breakthroughs we can make, this this is the commercial breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it shows them headbutting that way. And it's evidently been cited as one of the things that really popularized that image. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is neat to me. It's it's neat that it became a, even that far, this is like in the 1950s, mm -hmm. it became a pop culture thing back then. Which is cool because, and I, I think that probably has a lot to do with the what the first specimens we discovered were. Mm -hmm. Because Pachycephalosaurus itself is very iconic and it its dome is really pronounced. Yeah, it's one of the most extreme out of all of them. Whereas if you look at Stiggy Moloch... Right. Stiggy Moloch, it's got the dome going on, but its face is draconic. Yeah. It's got armor all over the head. It's got spikes and knobs sticking out in all directions. The dome practically hides among this nest of other junk that's going on. Yeah. In fact, one of its cousins was named Draco Rex Hogwartsii. Indeed. <laughs> and I, I wonder if we had discovered things like that first if the idea of it being for display mm -hmm. would have caught on faster than the headbutting thing. Exactly, yeah. If if we hadn't found the one wearing the helmet yes. first. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, Stiggy Moloch has a very, very different design. It still it does have the little little bump for a dome, yeah. but it, it's got way more in the horn ornamentation. And that's why a lot of people have suggested that maybe they're not ramming, but they're doing a uh, uh, was they called flank budding? Flank budding, yeah. Where they're basically, if you if you look up videos of uh, giraffes fighting, yeah, smacking their heads into each other. Yeah, and um, I know that uh, wildebeest will do this. That where they, oh, okay, huh? Their horns are made for side swiping. Basically, you're not ramming, you're not charging, but you're swinging your head side to side. Interesting. And it's that idea. It's uh, there's a lot of antelope that do it too, where they're the ones with the little short horns that point straight backwards. Yeah. For like getting into the hip and leg region and that they may have been going up and standing side by side, you know, like docking each yep. one with his head next to the other and then swing the head sideways like a wrecking ball instead of a battering ram. Yeah. And, Which is or, cool because that's harder to test. Yeah. And it's, it's also it's hard to find evidence for that. With those backward facing horns, you're now catching them and hooking them. Which is uh, much more sinister than headbutting. Yeah, absolutely. Like, th that can disembowel if you get them yeah. the right way. And so it's interesting. I mean, there's been lots of, like, there's lots of papers looking at it. You know, some people have reconstructed it to show that the spine should actually line up straight like a ram's back would and other mm -hmm. charging animals. But others have shown that it reconstructs in an S-curve, so it wouldn't be good for ramming. And yeah. so it's... It, it's, I don't know, it's interesting, but they've also found pathologies. Like, they find very yeah. commonly injuries on the dome. So I don't know, it's, 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 one of behavior is always mysteries. hard to unravel. This is a particularly cool one, because it's, the reason it's hard to unravel is it's a body type that we don't have today, so we don't know. Yeah, and, and behavior can be so variable regarding things like that. that Absolutely. It's just really, and it, it means that artists get to explore a whole lot. Yeah. Speaking of things we don't know, yeah. uh, the thing that always comes first to mind for me when I hear Stiggy Moloch is the, what I'm going to call the Horner argument, although I think it's not just Horner. Yes. Uh, he that... has popularized it. Yes. 
because uh, Backer, I think, was is one of the pr- primary people who's made the that suggestion as well, that Stiggy Moloch is not real in the sense that we have perhaps given a name. It's, it's uh, what what is it called when it's um, the the mass delusion where we all, the the collective subconscious, we've all imagined. <laughs> we all imagined Stiggy Moloch. Stiggy Moloch. <laughs> <laughs> we all remember it's like the um the mandela effect yes yes the mandela effect yeah, that's what i was we've, looking for <laughs> we have we have conjured sticky moloch into existence <laughs> no no i'm sure i saw it in a museum once I think I saw it there too. <laughs> when i was a kid didn't you see it too uh yeah the, this idea that sticky moloch might not be its own species mm-hmm. but a juvenile form of pachycephalosaurus which is interesting yeah, well, it's it, this has been suggested for a lot of dinosaurs. Yeah, it's 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 come up a number of times, and with good reason. Yeah, Nanotyrannus and, and Tyrannosaurus, yeah. Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Yeah, and it's you know a, a, as we explore more, we're discovering just how variable dinosaurs can be, especially in their ornamentation. Yeah, uh, they change a lot as they grow up. They can perhaps be very different between the sexes. Mm-hmm. And so one of the big arguments that's been put forth by some is that Stiggy Moloch, we don't have any adults of Stiggy Moloch, and we don't have any juveniles of Pachycephalosaurus. Yeah. And that Stiggy Moloch fossils show evidence of their skulls not being completely finished forming yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, some have gone farther and actually said that Draco Rex, Stiggy Moloch, and Pachycephalosaurus might represent an ontogenetic series. Yes. Three youngest to oldest. Of the growth. I think Longrich at all even said that, uh, hypothesized that flat-headed pachycephalosaurs, instead of being a different group of pachycephalosaurs, are just juveniles. Mm-hmm. And that the heads changed shape as they got older, yeah, they, they which we know swell. in part is, is true, that the heads did sh- shift yeah. as which they got Which makes sense. Older. That That's, you know, a a human skull from child to adulthood I mean, we look like the greys from X-Files when we're babies. <laughs> yes, we do. Like, if you look at the skull, we look very alien because our yeah. proportions change. Same thing happens with alligators and most animals. And indeed, it's not unprecedented for there to be an animal that fits a different niche mm-hmm. at different life stages. Crocodilians uh, do that. Yeah. Uh, tyrannosaurs. There's been a lot of look- studies looking at T-Rex mm-hmm. and showing that it's body proportions as a teenager were fit to do different things than its body proportions as an adult. Yeah, exactly, because it's, you don't want to be competing with the big versions of yourself. Yes. So you specialize to hunt something different while you're growing. Yeah, if you're not going to, you're never going to make it the 20 years it takes you to get to adult size if you're competing with adult T-Rex. Exactly. And so it makes sense. It's It's niche partitioning within a species. Yeah. Through a growth stage. So that's... It, this dinosaur always reminds me of this broader mm-hmm. rearrangement of the dinosaur species list that has been suggested, right? That's still highly debated. Because other people have yes. pointed out that... You know, one of the other arguments is that those three genera, Pachycephalosaurus, Draco, Rex, Tiggy, Moloch, are also found in the same place at the same time. Yeah. But some others have pointed to evidence that they might actually not be, that they, mm-hmm. they might actually be slightly different in time. So there's still, and there are some other arguments against it. So, so it's certainly not universally accepted, although a, a handful of recent papers have already been grouping Stiggy Moloch under Pachycephalosaurus following this synonymization. This is, this is a, so this, this makes me think of two main things. The first is it's a really good example of how, so, you know how little we know on certain things, and how you know, a dinosaur species is not always as solid as it seems. That this is how these the process actually happens. Like you're getting, you know, you can see us amid the process of something like this getting decided, to where it, some papers are starting to use it. And that's you know people always talk about a uh, scientific consensus. And it's not like everyone votes. It is some people go makes sense to me. I'm using it in my paper. Yes. Because I think it I think it holds water. I think it is substantial enough that it we can move forward with it. And once enough people feel that way, that's scientific consensus. Once we've all gone, okay, yeah, it makes sense to 
99% of us, we're then we're good to go ahead and move forward. We're no longer going to argue about it because we, there's not enough people to have an argument. Yes, the evidence has b- gradually convinced more and more people mm-hmm. as more evidence has come to light. Fewer people have le- le- legitimate arguments. Yep. So before we were saying that can't be true because of this. Well, that argument's not true anymore because we yeah. have more data. So it's really cool because you get to see the process. The other thing that this makes me think of, and I'm looking at one of the images where they compare the sizes between Draco Rex, Tiki Moloch, and Pachycephalosaurus. Yes. And you can see you know, the nice head transition. And man, did Pokemon really miss an opportunity to have the three-stage evolution of flat, slightly domed and domed. <laughs> yes, they did. That would oh. require them to have a three-stage fossil Pokemon, which is non-existent. I know, which is which break the trend, day. but oh man. <laughs> Maybe they need, <laughs> to, they cool. need to have a time travel game where you're going back so that they're not technically fossil Pokemon, they're just Pokemon. <laughs> you're going <laughs> back think... to before they were reanimated. I think the game you're looking for is called Saurian. <laughs> it's, it's a monster hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Where you will get to experience ontogenetic stages of Pachycephalosaurus. It's going to be one of the playable dinosaurs, I believe. Oh, yeah, it is. That'll be fun. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is a, it's a neat animal. It's cool looking. I've always loved it just visually. It's just... It looks I, super I'm cool. A, I'm a sucker for animals that look cool objectively to where it's like you look like you were designed for a toy line yeah (laughs) you i you look awesome absolutely it looks like it was made to appeal to children yes exactly like all right this is going to be the edgy one in the cartoon series that's got the spikes we'll give them a nose ring to (laughs) them yeah it also it's funny because some of the images of stiggy moloch i look at it and i and i'm i can't help but wonder why people insist on choosing theropods as their villains. Right? Stiggy Moloch and Draco Rex are terrifying. Which, is, that always stood out to me, because in Land Before Time, Pachycephalosaurus shows up mm-hmm. and terrorizes all the little dinosaurs. Yeah, they're, when they're For some scary. reason, they're underground. I don't know why they're underground. Uh, oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, the pa- like, right. I know why the kids are underground. I don't know why the Pachycephalosaurs were already down there, <laughs> <laughs> headbutting each other. That's and then, where the dinosaur fight club is. Like, go on a rampage of trying to crush these little dinosaurs with their big dome heads. And it's terrifying. Yeah, they were super scary. They're like roaring at them. And I always remember thinking like, why? Why are these being bad? Yeah. It, Pachycephalosaurus would be, if we lived alongside dinosaurs, that would be one of the animals that uh, tourists stupidly get too close to in the yeah. national parks and yep. get attacked by. Yep. There's a there's a great video I just saw. It's a really short one of just this angry goat. Uh, no horns. It's a female goat, it looked like. But she's mm-hmm. just headbutting people. Like, she got out <laughs> into, like, just the streets. And she just keeps coming up to these people and headbutting them. And people keep trying to do something about it. Like, one guy goes over to, like, kick. She just, like, dodges his kick and, like, headbutts him in the groin. <laughs> uh, like, and it's just wow. terrorizing, like, half a dozen people. <laughs> That's what pachycephalosaurs would be doing. They'd be running around. Someone would honk their horn at them and they'd break their headlight. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> These little scrappy, tough animals. Oh, man. We leave you, Danielle, with that image of Indeed. Stiggy Moloch running through traffic, <laughs> knocking people over and breaking headlights. <laughs> Just trotting along. All right. Well, thank you again for your contribution and for the chance to talk about this really cool dinosaur. Absolutely. This was a lot of fun. I hope we did some justice mm-hmm. to your chosen creature. It is a very good choice. Stay in touch. We, we love having you as a fan and a listener. Indeed. Uh, we hope to hear from you uh, as, a, as a fan and contributor and just everything else in the future. And with that, we conclude your very, very special episode of Common Sense Podcast. Please check in next time. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. See you, Danielle. Bye. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, Michael. Thanks for your support on our Patreon. Thank you, Michael. This is your own special mini personalized episode. You asked us to talk about Cryptobranchids. Yeah. Which is a really good choice. Now, normally when we do these, we just sort of 
talk about our own thoughts and musings on the group. Just kind of off the top of the head. But it so happens that my office area at work at the museum is right next door to the office area of a person who has actually done research on cryptobranchids. So we invited her to join us. Hi, Keela. Hello. Keela, you uh, have done research on fossil cryptobranchids. I did as part of my master's thesis here at UTSU. Cool. Very cool. Well, Michael has, is interested in cryptobranchids and apparently, according to his message, has gotten to take care of at least one. I think he said it was a Japanese giant salamander. Which is so cool. And Which I is am great. super jealous. Right? <laughs> awesome. Uh, have you gotten to work with the live ones very much? So uh, around here we have hellbenders that exist in the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been able to go noodling and find hellbenders in the wild. Ooh. And also have um, seen them in zoos as part of a conservation program. Of course, as you know. Right, right. Like a lot of amphibians, they're not doing great in the wild. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's amphibians don't respond well to changes in the water system and then also big you know the bigger they are typically yeah big animals don't do no. great in stressed ecosystems with yeah. humans yeah part of the yeah. problem is that they are very sensitive to pollutants because they do breathe through their skin the other right. issue is they're the giant salamanders so hellbenders take it's it's thought between six and eight years for females to reach maturity wow yeah is that the? Do you know if that's similar for the giants, the Asian giant salamanders? I don't actually know. If hmm. I were going to, you know, throw a guess out there, I would think it would take them longer. Yeah, yeah, I would assume so. Because they are five feet long. Yeah, <laughs> because they're big. monstrous. They're so big. You were telling me about your favorite story about the Asian giant salamanders, about their role in historical legend. Oh, yeah. So I have, a, <laughs> I have a really silly thing that I like to think about Andreas. That's the genus name of the Japanese and giants, or Japanese and Chinese giant salamander. I have a silly thing that I like to think, and it's really loose, and it doesn't really mean anything, except <laughs> it's a cool thing that I like to think about, which is that there is, in Japanese folklore, an aquatic hobgoblin type creature called a kappa yes yep <laughs> and it's possible that this is based in part on these giant five foot arms like a toddler <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. salamanders <laughs> you know people in north america find a hellbender and it's called a hellbender because they probably think some very unkind yep. things about these salamanders. This little demon creature. Yeah, it's right. like, and, and surely a salamander this size could only come from hell. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they're two feet long at most. Like, that's the that's the maximum record. So, I'd imagine those feelings are kind of amplified <laughs> <laughs> probably logarithmically with size upon finding something five feet long scurrying about on the bank of a river. So, it's it's, it's, it's a good possibility that these guys played a role in the formation of these Kappa myths. Yeah. So. Well, when you, if you're in China, then you have salamanders that are the same, roughly the same maximum size as your alligators. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, that's, that's an intense amphibian. <laughs> it is an intense amphibian. Well, it's, I Nobody told them the Devonian is over. Yeah. <laughs> they did not get the memo. The first time I ever saw one in a documentary in, like, full they were doing measurements and so they had brought one out of the water and they had a little um half pipe that they yeah so it scooped it, it just slid into the pipe and it had the measuring tape and one of the people got too close and it lunged at the person open mouth wow and not only did it look like a crocodile but i'd never seen a salamander do that <laughs> and oh, it was yes. like that's a that's a squishy seal that just tried to bite you that's awesome. It's horrifying, but awesome. It's a slimigator. The, the added bonus is that their mouths just kind of open like a hinge. Wow. Flat open like tremors. <laughs> and the inside of it is very pale, which is a good contrast to their dark brown skin. So yeah. it's very dramatic when they do yeah. the floppy lunge. <laughs> so what was your cryptobranchid research about? So I looked at some hellbender fossils from caves in West Virginia and um, found that they were not a separate species. 
as previously thought, but were in fact the same as the modern living hellbender salamander, wow. Cryptobranchus alleghaniensis. And so that that means that they were around at least since the Irvingtonian portion of the Pleistocene, which was a little older than hellbender fossils had been found previously, and also from rivers that they had not been found in previously. They don't live there now. So by identifying this fossil as the same thing mm -hmm. as the modern species, you effectively uh, discovered a range extension in time. Yes. They go back further. That's and cool. If I remember right from talking to you, and I was there at your thesis <laughs> presentation. Oh, yeah, you were. That's the first one I ever saw. So uh, Keela is a, was a master's student in the same program that Will and I were at ETSU, here at ETSU, because we're sitting at the fossil site. Yes. Um, you the, the species had been named by Holman. Yes. Who was a famous amphibian and reptile fossil researcher. Wrote and the book. Literally <laughs> wrote the book on North American <laughs> fossil salamanders. And so you got to be the uppity grad student who came in and oh, told Holman he was wrong. I didn't tell Holman he was wrong because he had died shortly before I started my work. Ah. Which made me feel even worse. <laughs> yeah. Now that that guy's yeah. out of the way. <laughs> oh, no. In memoriam, he wasn't, he was wrong. <laughs> so what, what made you decide Cryptobranchids? I just love them. I just love them. They have a hideousness that is highly charismatic, <laughs> at least to me. Well said. I like that a lot. That is very true. They they're just they're just horrible looking. I love them. I, I grew up in an area that has hellbenders, and I didn't know they were a thing until I got to college, which is really remarkable for the kind of life that I lived as a child which was stomping around in creeks and turning over rocks, which is coincidentally how you find help. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen numerous other kinds of salamanders, but didn't know this was a thing. Yeah, I guess that says something to the hellbenders' stealth abilities. Yeah. They're super stealthy. That pattern on their backs matches the bottom of the stream bed just exactly. Yeah. I guess they're kind of legendary. Well, that's... I, yeah, I always... Almost mythical. Yeah. Well, I, I always love when they're... Um, in a habitat at a zoo, you know, in the reptile house, the herp house at a zoo, uh, because their habitat is always one of those where you see lots of people questioning the sign whether there's actually an uh -huh. animal in there. Yeah. And it's that bit of challenge <laughs> to come in and be like, no, 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 the squishy thing in the back. That's the hellbender. <laughs> so that's exactly the experience that I had the first time I got to see one of the giant cryptobranchids. Mm -hmm. I was at a zoo in, I want to say Omaha. Could have been the National Zoo. I know they, they have them as well. But I know what I'm looking for. You know, I know what an Andreas salamander is supposed to look like, how big they are. And I am still standing in front of this enclosure and seeing nothing. Just, but, but I want to see this thing. So <laughs> I'm patient. And I'm looking everywhere, everywhere. And then I saw this little color that I wasn't expecting to be and it was its little pink toe pads. Yes. Yep. The little stubby on toes. A hand the size of a toddler. <laughs> and when I saw that, I said, "Ah!" And the lady standing next to me said, "Why did you say ah?" <laughs> and I said, "Look, there's its arm." And she said, "Ah!" <laughs> They're so, so I, they're so fantastic. It was hiding in plain sight, mm -hmm. just due to its size. Like it, it escaped. Right, right. My you couldn't see the parameters. forest for the trees. Yeah. yeah. Just by so I don't know a ton about salamanders, mm -hmm. um, but salamanders are one of those groups of animals that averages the size that you could hide one in your hand. These oh, yeah. are these are generally very small animals. Do you know anything about how how do cryptobranchids? have to function differently being like t a, an entire magnitude order of magnitude <laughs> larger than what a salamander is meant to be. So one of the things that they have to do since they do respire through their skin because they don't have the same favorable surface area to mm -hmm. interior volume ratio so they have those fiddly flaps of skin down the side of them. I, the latest crop of grad students call hellbenders old lasagna sides. <laughs> All right. For that reason. Nope. But, but I like that, but my favorite nickname still is Snot Otter. Yeah. I, that is a good name. Snot Otter is absolutely yeah. 
the superior yeah. name. So that's one thing that they have to deal with. Due to and the is that just increasing surface area mm-hmm. for respiration? Yeah, they do also live in highly oxygenated streams. And so it's typically sense. very cold water, if yeah. I remember right. It's, it's, it's cold because the cold water carries more mm-hmm. oxygen with it. It's, it. It is always a standout thing about an animal when there's there's only two. There's there's two that get that big. Yeah. And then the other one is still big, but not anywhere near well, the there's, size. Like, there's, we have here in North America the unexpectedly, unreasonably large salamanders. Mm-hmm. And then over in Japan, they have the kaiju version. Yes, exactly. Of that animal. <laughs> it's like, you think that two feet, you say, you know what? ain't nothing. If you didn't say kaiju, I was going to. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they, they ha- it has its own theme song. <laughs> I actually have two, funnily enough, uh, cryptobranchids, I, I have two th- senior or er, er, grad student thesis stories with cryptobranchids. <laughs> because one, I came to UTSU to visit the semester before I actually started here with Dr. Russ Graham. And I got to sit and watch Keela's uh, uh, thesis presentation about cryptobranchids. I was but a an undergraduate little boy and I had no idea what was going on. I was like, oh, cool, science. But then later, one of the things that we've probably mentioned this on the podcast that we do with the senior, or the, the grad theses here at ETSU is the professors will bring in mystery specimens and test the student who's giving the presentation. And it's super fun to be all smug when the spotlight's not on you and sit in the audience and be like, I know what that is. Mm-hmm. And the first time I ever felt smug was during Liz's thesis. I don't know if you knew Liz. Because they brought out a cryptobranchid skull. That was not the only time that cryptobranchid skull appeared. And I remember they sure brought it up not. to Liz. And to her credit, you know, she was in the spotlight and so she was struggling with it. And I remember going... That's a cryptobranchid skull because nothing Mm-mm. has a skull. Nothing living. Yeah. Has a skull like cryptobranchids. <laughs> so, the first described fossil cryptobranchid, not the first fossil cryptobranchid, yes, but, but the, the first, first described one, was a large Andreas type salamander from Europe, and it was described as, I'm going to butcher the Latin, Homo Dil- testis diluvi, yes. or something like that. And what it translated to was, man, witness to the flood. Because apparently it was interpreted as a human head. A human head buried as, I guess, one of the sinners. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, in a biblical story. But if you actually drew that head and made it into a human, it would be really weird. It's like Arnold from Hey Arnold. It has yes. like a football shaped yeah. head. <laughs> yeah, very domed. Very domed. Yeah. Well, because they were looking at also it. Also, teeth up there. From the top. And where the eyes, because if you look at the skull from the top, the eyes are kind of sort of in the middle of the skull. So they assume that was the face. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, where the tooth row is, is the dome of the head. And the eyes are here in the middle. And so, yeah, the witness to the flood. A headband made of salamander (laughs) teeth. Yes. (laughs) What did that, do you know what that ended up being? You know, I I wrote it down a long time ago, and now I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if if you look up Homo testis diluvii, something like that, yeah. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. I like well because they're they're legendary both in living, oh yeah, (laughs) and in fossil, Mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah, they're neat. Michael, this was a very good choice of a group of animals to talk about. Mm-hmm. You're a man of class and distinction. <laughs> <laughs> and it was an opportunity for us to get Keela to talk into the microphone with us a bit, which is very fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, guys, I had fun. <laughs> yeah. So, Michael, thank you once again for your support, for listening, for this request, which we had a lot of fun doing. And hopefully we will, I mean, maybe someday we'll do salamander talk on a main episode surely surely salamanders will get a nap sometimes yes. you haven't talked about salamanders shame on you we got yelled at recently by a <sighs> listener who was saying we are 70 as of this recording we are 77 episodes released we have yet to do an amphibians episode although the last one was the fish to tetrapod transition so, so they, we did talk about earliest tetrapods those are not less amphibians they are not less amphibia no, we not. have yet to do a dedicated amphibians episode. I've never been more disappointed in you both. We are slaves yeah. to the list. <laughs> we, I mean, our listeners, we, we, we go where the where the episode request list takes us. 
Keela, thanks so much for joining us to chat about Sound You're very welcome. It was a blast. It was tons of fun. Bye. See ya. Bye. Hi, Will. Hi, David. Hi, Beth. Hello, Beth. Hi, Kitty. Hi, Kitty. Hey, there's a cat in here. Beth, this is your very own patron micro episode, which we like to do for our very best patrons. We appreciate your patronage so much that we're going to do an episode, as you requested, uh, talk about parrots. There's also a cat. <laughs> Hello. She is also very interested in talking about parrots. I don't know that this kitty has ever met a parrot. Ooh, yeah. I, I bet not. All right, well, we're going to put you in my lap. So cetacoforms is the order that includes parrots, which I learned, because I wasn't sure, mm -hmm. is parrots and parakeets and macaws and cockatoos and lorikeets, and I think a few other things. All of the weird beaked ones. Yeah, they've got that curved beak, great right. for cracking nuts and stuff. Yeah, the, the can opener beak. And they have a schizodactyl, zygodactyl, they have zygodactyl, zygodactyl feet, mm -hmm. which means two feet in one direction, two toes in one direction, two toes in the other. And it means that they have little, uh, like those claws that kids will yes. pick up at a gift shop and they can use it to pick stuff up. Yep, yep. Yeah. They got little chameleon feet. They do. But much more dexterous. Parrots are also often very stunning to look at. Yeah, they're really vibrant. They're pretty. Uh, and they're noisy. Very, like, I'm... Always impressed by parrots. And they're not the only birds that can do this, but, you know, they're the famous ones for being able to mimic human voices. Yep. But they can mimic lots of stuff. Like, you know, I've seen videos of them meowing at dogs. Yep. And stuff like that. Like, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And it's fascinating because I don't know when or how that becomes useful in their survival, but it's cool that they can do it. Well, I've seen some other birds use... So I've seen mimicry used for courtship. Mm -hmm. Like the lyre bird very yep. famously does that. And then there is... I can't think of the name of this bird off the top of my head, but there is a bird in Africa that mimics other noises to scare oh, yeah. competitors away from food. Yeah, there's, there's the one that... Uh... Oh, no, I know. I, I have heard of the one you're talking about. I was thinking about the one that um, fakes the alarm calls. Yeah, for that's the, the, yeah, that's yeah, the one. That is, it'll, right. it'll fake another species alarm call so that they all get scared and run away, and then it goes over and eats the food that they, that they yep. dropped. So mimicry is something that has all these cool uses, and because it's widespread in birds... Uh, Beth, you said in your email that you were fascinated when you learned that birds are dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder how much we would have seen that in other dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. Like, you, there has to have been, like, especially, like, the small Dromaea forms. The, oh, yeah. The, I, I would be so surprised if they weren't noisy and creative mm -hmm. with their, their vocalizations. It Yeah, it's a fascinating question on how, how early did that complex noise-making show up in this lineage. Because, like, crows, what was it? I can't remember where I read it. But there, there was a, uh, like, shelter where crows would say caw, making fun of how often they hear <laughs> humans right, caw right, right. at them. That's hilarious. Not cawing as a crow, <laughs> right. but saying caw, They'd caw, caw, caw. And then one of the people was like, yeah, they're mocking us. <laughs> so I, do you, do you have personal experience with parrots? I, I don't. I've never, I've never really met one up close, uh. I, I've gotten to see them. I've gotten to like, you know, handlers have brought them out at zoos and stuff. So I've gotten to okay. see them up close, but I've never, we didn't have any at the aquarium. And the closest I ever came to wild ones was when I was in Australia on one of the islands. There were all these little parakeets that were just like flocks of, oh, that's like cool. that, those were the birds that were everywhere instead of pigeons. And right, it was right, awesome. Right. I, at the nature center I worked at in New York, we had, two different types of parrots. We had a big blue and gold macaw named cool. Buddy, who, and I didn't handle Buddy. Only one guy handled Buddy because <laughs> Buddy was temperamental. <laughs> I remember you telling me <laughs> yeah. he didn't get along with people. Uh, but Buddy was fun. He said he was in a little enclosure right next to the front door 
to the place. And so people would come in and out and you, he would say goodbye to people. <laughs> like they'd walk out the door and he'd say, bye bye. And I remember one time, so I don't remember who was the, the main animal handler, uh, or it was a visitor who, who was asking, does he know what goodbye means? Mm-hmm. Or is he just saying it because he knows that that is what you say when people go through the door? And I remember thinking, what's the difference? Yeah. Like, yep. that's, that's why I do it. Because well, I know, I know that's what you say when people go through the door. It's the, it's the line <laughs> in the movie Transcendence. Weird movie, but I enjoy it. Uh, where they have the guy, uh, what I just blanked on. The actor? Yeah. Christian Bell. No. John, uh, Jason Statham. No. Don Cheadle. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Jack Sparrow. Oh, Johnny Depp? Johnny okay. Depp. <laughs> I, I, I don't know anything about Transcendence. I was just naming actors. I had the J, but I, <laughs> my brain was stuck on Jeff. Uh, sure. Jeff Foxworthy. Where he is working on an AI computer, and Morgan Freeman oh, that movie. comes okay. in and is talking to the AI computer and says, so can you prove that you're conscious and not just a facsimile? And then the computer goes, that's a good question. Can you? Yep. And it's... I I like that point. It was like, does do does the bird know what that word means, or is it just mimicking it? Well, that's how we learn language. Do you like? It's like the um, what was it? Endgame mm-hmm. when he says we have to go to Nita Valir. It's like that's a made up word. All oh. words are made up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other parrots we had at the center were a trio of sun conures. So Ooh. these are little parakeets. They are the, the the I think they're called sun parakeets. They're Aratinga something. And those I also didn't handle, and I only actually physically encountered them one time, because Matt, who was in charge of the birds, had them out because he was cleaning the cage, and they were just perched around places, and I walked into the room, and a couple of them flew over to me to say hi, and I hate them, (laughs) because they were bitey, and they were, like, climbing on my shoulders, and one of them came up and bit me on the ear, but it wasn't like a bite it was a clamp yeah yeah and i was like no and i kind of shrugged to brush him off and he didn't go and i was like oh <laughs> this bird may never let go yeah <laughs> i don't know how to get this bird I to let go of bird man ear. now because <laughs> those beaks are that they are made to hold and crack and crunch things that the thing that always stands out to me about parrots is they're the most unassumingly scary of the birds in my opinion, because like so many other birds look the way they are. Like a pigeon looks harmless. Yeah, because it's a pigeon. No, man, it's, it's not going to do much. It's harmless. Like even and, and, if one really wanted to hurt me, it'd have to get creative. Right. Uh, you know, and an eagle looks dangerous because it is. Yes. Like it's made to, it's made to take down things the size of our cat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. it's scary. Parrots look cartoony Mm -hmm. like they look so goofy they've got this round face and this beak that points down and not out they look like they're smiling and they got the big white eyes they're colorful they've got these weird feet and they walk around all funny they're goofy yeah no they're silly they are the primates of birds yes they very much are they're goofy and silly and noisy and funny and if you if you get on their nerves they'll just take your finger off right (laughs) yeah Ooh. like they their their mouth is i remember watching a video like the first time i got to see a really clear video of them just opening nuts Mm -hmm. and you know i was expecting like watching a bird open seeds at a bird feeder just where it's like this delicate yeah no he just went crack it was like Oh. Yeah. Well, and speaking of being the the primates of birds, which is a more apt comparison than it's I realized. It's really good. It, Buddy would eat peanuts. That was mm-hmm. his his favorite uh, treat. And so sometimes you could give Buddy a peanut, and he would take it in his beak and then hold it in his foot because mm-hmm. he would stand on one foot and lift the other foot and use it like a hand to hold the peanut, and then he'd crack it open with the tip. Yeah, like a like a, a, a an incision hit, and then pull a peanut out from inside, and he'd spit out the shell, and then eat the peanuts, and they're just so fascinating mm-hmm. to like those feet, much like a chameleon. Like you made the comparison, 
super dexterous, great for trees, great for holding food, real goofy on the floor. Yeah. Parrots are so awkward on the floor because that's not what those feet are for. <laughs> hey, so it's like when you watch, uh, you know, a chimpanzee or, or other, other close cousin ape just try to walk on two feet. Mm-hmm. It's not that they can't. They can. You know, we didn't, we used to think they couldn't unless they were in water, but they can. But it's real awkward. Like, yeah. if they've got that swayness to it, their Your, balance isn't centered over the hips. You're not built to do that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not how your body fits together. But yeah, they, they really are very primate-esque and smart. And smart. Uh, you know, crows always get the fame for being <laughs> the smart and birds. And tropical. Yeah. Wow. This has been, uh, we've hit on something incredible here. So I think next time someone asks, what animals do we think will replace humans? Parrots. Uh, I'm going to say parakeets. Uh, we got, because they are the primates of birds. Psittacoforms will be, because, you know, people always go with cephalopods, which has been my vote, because I am all up for Cthulhu Atlantis. I'm on board. But, yeah, psittacoforms are much more reasonable. They've already got the ability to uh, uh, breathe air. Wow. Now I want a movie that's like Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. But it's Cytocoforms. It's just real noisy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, uh, so I, I was recently asked, so I, hey Beth, I write for SciShow, which is a YouTube channel that does sciencey stuff. And I was recently given the pitch to write an episode about the Carolina parakeet, mm-hmm. which is, th- th- as far as we know, the United States' only ever, at least in human history, endemic Cytocoforms. Which is crazy. There are other parrots that live in the U.S. So there are a couple species that are Mexican, but just barely make it up into the southern states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there are a few introduced species. Not surprising. But the Carolina parakeet was widespread across the eastern U.S. Passenger pigeon style, like flocks of hundreds and super noisy and went from enormous flocks hundreds strong in the mid 1800s to nothing by 1900 i learned that the last carolina parakeet in captivity died five years before martha the last passenger pigeon in the same zoo we should stop sending last birds that right (laughs) the cincinnati zoo stop sending them to cincinnati in like 1918 i think it was that's pretty crazy the last carolina parakeet also, while I was researching, the Carolina parakeet was apparently poisonous. Kind of. So, Carolina what? parakeets would eat cockleburr, mm. which is a type of plant that is toxic, and they were not affected by the toxin, but they'd eat so much of it that it would build up in their bodies, and historical reports, uh, accounts, cite the fact that cats that ate Carolina parakeets would often die. <laughs> <laughs> wow, they were monarch parrots. Yeah, because they were building up toxins in their body, and then they were fine with it, but predators couldn't handle it. Weird. Yeah. Oh, there's a, a at least one subpopulation of garter snake that is thought to do the same thing. Yes. They eat so many poisonous newts that it's thought they themselves might end up being poisonous if you ate them. Fascinating. <laughs> and so uh, I was trying to look up the parrot fossil record mm-hmm, mm-hmm. up here. Uh, now, parrots do not have, uh, t- I don't know much about it, but they're tropical. Yes. Which it makes means you're not going to get a lot of fossils to begin with. The tropics aren't great for fossilization, and they're not great for fossil sites. Nope. Also, they're birds, so they don't fossilize very well. There are, like, a co- two, to my knowledge, identified parrots in the U.S. fossil record. Hmm. I read about one in Nebraska that was identified in the 1920s, <laughs> which not everyone agrees with. And there is one identified at the Gray Fossil Site. Oh, yeah. We have Parrot on our list. I forgot about that. But it's a preliminary ID. And yes. I actually, when I was starting to write the episode, I went, I asked Chris, who is our head curator, I said, hey, if we have the Parrot, if, if that's what it is, then we are within the range of one of the subspecies of the Carolina parakeet and only a couple million years before the Carolina parakeet is thought to have diverged. So that would be really interesting to see if our fossil is related to it. And so it'd be cool to talk about in this SciShow episode Mm -hmm. 
how confident are we on that ID? And he said, eh, yeah, yeah. that's like a spreadsheet that someone wrote up early on of like, here's what all these birds look like. So I will not be mentioning it in the SciShow episode because yeah, we're not actually sure if that's what it is. Which makes sense. But we can hope. I, I absolutely hope we have a Sitica forum. That would be so cool. That would be super neat. So that's my brain dump about what I've been learning the last couple of days about the <laughs> Carolina parakeet. They're cool birds. Like, I feel they are cooler than they typically get credit for. Because, like, owls always get credit for being wise, even though they aren't. Ask anyone who's ever worked with an owl, they'll tell you they're dumb. <laughs> no, it's just uh, the big eyes. Yeah. Like, they look, <laughs> uh, they look pensive. <laughs> yes. But they're, they're evidently real stupid. Like, there, there is a fine line between pensive and vacant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've talked to many people who have worked with, uh, owls, and they say that they're, like, will fly into stuff stupid. Oh. Uh, they're not, very clever at all. Poor little fellers. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, parrots are, are always just the the clowns and whenever they are in cartoons and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not often that we get super smart parrot characters. And I feel that that's a shame. We should. How many parrot characters... I'm trying to think of what, like, film and TV parrot characters there have been. I'm sure there were some in, like, Madagascar and... Rio was that the name of that yeah, movie? Yeah, Rio the... was a parrot or a parakeet, probably. Yeah, uh, I mean, you got a Yago. That's true. You we have a Yago. Um, Who? I, one of my favorite. I actually really like the portrayal of Yago yes. in Aladdin because he's doing the jokey parrot mimicking people thing. Mm -hmm. But my favorite, my probably my favorite Yago moment is that he do, moments. Is that he does impressions. Yes, like he can do people's voices. Like spot on impressions of other people. <laughs> like that's such a fun little thing they put in yeah, there. Because he's Cause, a parrot. Because he's a parrot. <laughs> I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> There's, I don't remember his name. Because I don't remember any of the three amigos names except for Donald. Hmm. Uh, but the three capieros, one of them is a parrot. A Brazilian parrot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. And he's like a humanoid parrot like donald well there you go uh so yeah there's a few but yeah, i just they get overshadowed so often as just like pretty birds or things that go on pirate shoulders yeah but they're so they're like the, what is it is it the african gray parrot that's mm -hmm. one of the smartest birds yeah there was a famous one who had a name mm -hmm. who might even still be i don't yeah. know i don't know if he's still alive i can't remember the name off the top of my head but very famously, like learned a bunch of words mm -hmm. and 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 had passed passed many of the human derived tests of intelligence. Yes, yeah, Alex. I think it was Alex. Oh, that sounds right. That might have been it. That's another thing to note. They live a really long time. Like some of them do. Oh yeah, no, they're 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 one of the kinds of pets that your children inherit. Yes, <laughs> which like there are so many of these weird things that are all awesome and just never get talked about. Yeah. Like I would love to see, I would love to see a thing that's like Harry Potter style with uh um fox the the phoenix, mm -hmm. but it's like a parrot that's just been in a family for like three generations. A parrot would be an awesome familiar. Yes, it would be a super cool. I'm gonna in institute that in D and D games yes. from now on. That you can have a parrot familiar if you want. And it could do so many cool... Like, you could... And then I could do a parrot voice. You could have a parrot as a familiar that could actually spy for you, because it could report back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, technically, Come depending back, on... Come what, what did they say? What class you're in, you have a tele telepathic link with your familiar, so they can report back Okay, anyway. well, then I'm going with uh, Ranger... Okay. Well, and yeah, <laughs> but they can report back to the whole group. Yeah. Like, or they can they deliver say? a message. Mm-hmm. You can just have a pet. You don't even need it's to be a familiar. Yeah. Or I, a friend. <laughs> I can have a pet <laughs> parrot in D&D that's more useful than the wizard's stupid familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it won't start... even take a slot in my things. I just have to go buy a parrot. We're going to start doing parrots in D&D. <laughs> it's, it's all parrots. It's all parrots all the time. <laughs> They're really cool animals. Beth, this was a great suggestion. <laughs> I really... I, 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 birds are always... A sticky area for me mm -hmm. because they are the group that I know the least about in comparison 
to how much I feel I should know about them. Yeah. Like, if someone asks me about butterflies, I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about butterflies, and I have no regrets about that, because I, that's not my specialty. Yes. I, like, it'd be cool to know more, but I don't feel like I should. But birds are vertebrates, and they're pretty much reptiles. Yep. And I just I just don't know a lot about them. So well, being I... able to, to dig a little into parrots recently has been a lot of fun. It's been a nice thing about the podcast, because it's forced us to learn more about things like birds from time to time. Uh, cause I've always felt the same way. Like I find birds fascinating. I think they're super cool. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me to go bird watching, I will politely decline. Yep. Same. Uh, <laughs> and I've always been that way. And I can't tell you exactly why. I just, I don't, I don't care to write down that I saw it. I'm much more rather see it at a zoo yeah. and read about it. Yeah. Bird, they're in that weird place. They're like fish. Yes, I, yes. Fish are super awesome. I feel the same way about fish. I, I think they're great. I think they're they're fascinating scientifically and culturally. Mm -hmm. I don't know nothing about fish, and I I yeah I was I, I had tons of fun learning about them at the aquarium. But then if I talk to an aquarist, you know, a person who does it as a hobby, I I have to stop them immediately because they're like, well, I have like fourteen variety of clownfish. I go, okay, clownfish is enough. Yep. <laughs> I don't Nemo. care if it's blue. Nemo, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, good suggestion. Good, ho good episode. We'll get to talk more about birds. We will definitely do more birds because we have some bird suggestions. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Beth, thank you so much for being a patron. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your suggestion. This was a lot of fun. Yes. We hope you've enjoyed your little micro episode, <laughs> our musings about Sitica forms. And we're going to go back to, you know, doing our normal stuff. Yeah, to just learning about scaly reptiles. More podcasts to come. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. Hi, David. Hello, Will. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Barbara. We're here to talk about graboids. Ooh, just for our, one of our favorite patrons. Absolutely. I was so excited when you asked us to talk about graboids. That's awesome. <laughs> it's fun, because we've only actually done a few of these. Yeah. And the idea was, name a group of animals, and we'll talk about it, because we can do, the yeah, pick an animal, we can talk for 15 minutes about exactly. it. Exactly. Like, give us your favorite, you know, your favorite animal, or the one that you want to hear talked about that doesn't get right. talked about. And I like that... Every time so far, people have tried to push the limits, the yeah. boundaries, like find, okay, how about this? And this is awesome. It's so <laughs> good. Oh, it's such a good idea. So these are personally some of my favorite films. I love the Tremor series. So I was very excited to, to get speculative with, I mean, it, it was one of those, it was going to come up at some point in the podcast because I and wasn't going to. probably still will. Yes. I'm not going to allow it to. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I personally have only seen the first Tremors, mm -hmm. and I rather enjoy it, Yep. but I haven't seen the rest of the franchise. Yeah, and so the the cool thing with the rest of the franchise is that it fills in, each movie fills in a little bit more of the Graboid life cycle. So we see the big worms in the first film, and we get to see a whole bunch about their anatomy and everything and how they function and all that good stuff, but in each next film, they add a next step to the life cycle until we eventually have the entire uh, uh, life process, reproductive process of the graboids. That's pretty cool. It's actually, and it's, it's a cool life cycle that they came up with for them. So maybe what we should do in the spirit of our spooky episodes is have you briefly explain mm -hmm. what graboids are. Yep. Uh, for, you know, the, to, to have it all laid out, but also so that I know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so in the first one, we have the big graboids, Big worms with little mouth tongues mm -hmm. to grab their food. In the second movie, we find out that when those have eaten enough, they hit a point to where they come above ground and burst open. Okay. Giving birth to three, what they call shriekers, which are these little... Uh, I think I've seen these. Yeah, these little theropod graboids, basically. They've got the same face, so they they... That's one of my favorite things about the series is they maintain aspects of the anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't just become a completely new monster. It still has the, you know, a uh, chitinous, you know, four-part mouth face. Right, right. But now it is 
much smaller, you know, so probably about wolf-sized, but with two big chicken legs, big theropod legs, beefy legs. They're running around, and these, instead of sensing sound, are sensing heat, so they see infrared. Interesting. So they're going after warm-bodied targets, and these are all about feeding, and then they, evolution-style, barf up a baby. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and a- asexually reproduce. Right, right. So the interesting huh. thing about the life cycle is the big ones are like caterpillars that are just building up body mass. Right, right. They give birth to these, and then this is actually where their numbers increase. Interesting. So now shriekers reproduce however for however long there is food available, and then they eventually will shed their skin to become butt blasters, the, the show... Uses a different term. <laughs> right, right, right. I think this this is a micro episode. Yeah. I think we can get away with so it. So the official term being ass blasters. Right. They've shed their skin still bipedal. Uh, no front limbs on either one. Okay. Uh, so still bipedal, a little more slender, and they now have these fins down the side and back. Hmm. And they have a bombardier beetle abdomen going on where they, they sit there and they shake their abdomen to mix these chemicals that have an explosive result. To then launch them, and then they glide to new locations. That's pretty cool. So the whole so these I- are the dispersers. These are the dispersers. So ah. graboid eats, 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 yeah. bursts into shriekers, which then eat and reproduce. Right. And then those shed into ass blasters, which launch off, and inside each ass blaster is a single graboid egg. That And then becomes the big worms. That becomes the big worms. So what do the... Shrieker eggs become. So the shrieker eggs become, what do they call them? Dirt dragons. Uh, okay. That you see in the fourth one, which are basically just little graboids. So that is, huh. uh, from the egg hatches a graboid, but they start off very small, and their hunting style changes. Instead of being big ambush predators or pursuit predators, they are ambush, but they leap from the dirt. They have much more... Ooh, they're like a... a... Sharks coming yeah. up out of the water. They have longer spines uh, versus the smaller spines on the graboid that can push them much faster. And so they actually jump out at prey, launching like a little torpedo from the ground. And then just get bigger over time and take on the adult anatomy. Okay, so it goes graboid, shrieker, graboid, shrieker. But then the ass blasters will carry that cycle to a new place. Yeah, and so from what we can see, it, it actually goes, it goes graboid, shrieker, shriekers become ass blasters. So that's the, actually the mature form, right? Is an ass blaster, which then carries it off. Uh, the shriekers only give rise to new shriekers. Oh, I see. okay, okay. So I when see, they see. shed, they develop a graboid egg. Each individual would have one egg that then they carry to a new location, where a new population of shriekers would come from the graboid that hatches there. I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So it's it's weird. Interesting. Yeah, the, yeah. The big form is really just like a big caterpillar. The reproductive form, like I assume, if these were animals that you actually saw in a habitat, shriekers would be the ones you'd be dealing with most often. Right, out in the open, yeah. running around. They'd just be going around, milling about, eating stuff, reproducing, and for the most part, they wouldn't be a big deal until they had matured enough to shed their skin and then glide off. Now, in the Original Tremors, in the first mm-hmm. movie, if I remember correctly, they say that these organisms are a holdover from Precambrian times. Yeah, they. I think in the first one they just say that they have they must predate the fossil record. That's right. That's the and line. then in the second one they they a uh, scientist reveals a like long misidentified fossil of one of the keratin scoops for pushing them through the mud right 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 uh i remember that line predates the fossil record because i remember seeing it and going that's not how it works <laughs> no 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 <laughs> yeah and then they reveal that that fossil is supposed to be precambrian okay and so they go i guess the graboids have been around since that time right which I th- is also the uh, approach that Primeval took with their giant worm yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the answer for why they suddenly showed up and we don't have a history of encounters is the the typical there was a dormant egg that somehow has survived. For 600 million years. Yep. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> that uh, got washed <laughs> out of the mud during mining 
slurging, right, right, slurring the, the mountainside, the rain of fire, excuse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, is that so? They <laughs> they awoke at eggs. Those hatched into the babies, which then by the first movie had matured into big graboids. I would like to suggest just by uh, mouth anatomy mm -hmm. that graboids share a common ancestor with xenomorphs. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> seriously. And that's, I was, uh, I looked up the wiki, the fandom wiki, just so that I could remember, you know, was it pre-Cambrian that they said and whatnot. And there was one part of it that was making the point that they never actually confirmed that they're not something weird like that. They've just at least been on Earth. Right. Since now, the Precambrian. That is the one way you could predate the fossil record. Yep. Is if you predate Earth. Yes. So, so the description of these uh, brings to my mind our spooky Hydra. It does. Yeah. Where it is a big, armored, carnivorous worm creature mm -hmm. that we... I mean, worm. there's so many worms to, to play yes. with. But this is one that metamorphoses. And, and the thing that's weird with Graboids is they get called worms... But other than the fact that they have a long body and that the multiple times we see them burst into goo, we don't see an in internal skeleton. But right. they're scaly. Like, they True. give them a scaly reptilian hide. Uh, they have a hard uh, skull-like head. Yeah. Uh, which is not wholly unworm-like. Right. It sounds like they have a life stage where they are standing. Yeah, but they are definite like vertebrates right right they have jointed limbs they have it is scaly reptilian bodies let me ask you this question what are the eggs like the eggs so the eggs look fairly generic if i remember right they are they made them about like sauropod egg size so you know okay football but are they leathery are they hard shelled like bird eggs i feel like they looked different in two different things i'm gonna bring up a picture we're so gonna we look it right up so here's, I'll explain while Will looks it up why. I'm going to guess that they're not like clear and transparent and, and squishy like no, they fish definitely, eggs or frog eggs. They definitely look like they had definite shells. So in that case, if we're going on a, a scale, external scales, and what appears to be an internal skeleton, and hard-shelled eggs, these are apparently reptiles. Yeah, Let's that's see. we got a picture of. That's what I couldn't remember is I knew they had some pattern on them, but I couldn't remember what the pattern is. They have this kind of corkscrew pattern. So they look they made them look very insect egg esque, where it's like Okay. My egg has this weird shape to it. Interesting. But they're definitely like hard shelled eggs, because you see, they find remnants of the shells. Right, right. And they are chicken well, eggs. That sounds like an amniote. Yes, it does. So now what which is interesting because it, it to me it the question becomes if you have an animal with multiple life stages which life stage is most representative exactly of the ancestral state and so like if you look at uh, amphibians mm -hmm. you start out with these little weird looking larvae but the ancestral amphibian is salamander like yes at least Presumably, they weren't metamorphosing all the way back then, although fish do. So, hmm, well, yeah, who knows? <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, which of these is the weird form? Yes. Which of these is more representative of what group they come from? And if they're reptiles, then it sounds like the shriekers are the most, mm -hmm. that the, the more adult forms are more indicative of phylogeny yeah. than the big worm forms. Yep. That And that would definitely be what seems to make sense because they definitely uh and in the tv show uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> there are i wonder how much barbara has actually seen right i wonder if we've gone beyond yeah. what barbara has seen <laughs> <laughs> down the rabbit hole maybe maybe uh, you didn't know what you were asking for but there are there are a number of times in the the show where they reveal very obviously that like at sometimes you may have like a few graboids of like the big subterranean form right but they're not the common but thing you will very regularly have like plagues of shriekers right to where it's like up oh, a graboid burst in the montana desert and has been eating sheep and the shriekers have been eating sheep and now there's 50 of them right right right. and there, you know now there is a herd of shriekers in this desert so like they definitely present that Interesting. that's the more common more numerous uh, form, but they spend most of their time as the subterranean. Right. So that is 
cl- is is based more. It is more like a lot of insects. Yeah, where it's I'm a caterpillar most of my life, ch- life chowing down, getting fat, and right. then I become an adult for a much shorter for time. For a little bit, I reproduce, and then that's it. Yeah. I reproduce, I carry my eggs to some new place, and then that's it. Now, if they're reptiles, then Precambrian doesn't make any sense. Nope. Unless we're wrong about the whole fossil record. <laughs> it's, it's where the Saurian alien race. <laughs> now, granted, insect also wouldn't make any sense. So mm-hmm. they'd have to be like a branch off of the Ediacaran fauna. Yeah. That lived like an insect, but evolved convergently with reptiles. That's And that's the thing that, you know, to make it match the timeline the movie suggests, it would have to be a completely separate branch of life. Right. That just really followed our playbook real heavy. <laughs> and I could see, you know, if you had something arthropodian, yeah, arthropodian that made it onto land, achieved large body size, they could have evolved sturdy hard-shelled eggs for the same reason that amniotes did. Yeah. That it's something that can be laid anywhere. You they can be big, they contain their own water. Mm-hmm. So convergent Eggs have evolved multiple times. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, probably. I, huh, huh. I don't know, but there are many different kinds of eggs. Exactly. Yeah, like there have it been. Wouldn't surprise me if eggs have evolved multiple times. Although I'm suddenly realizing I don't actually, actually know if that's true. Yeah, there have definitely been multiple times similar eggs have evolved separately, yes. even if the origin. Isn't you? Yes. Well, well, somebody, no one has requested an eggs episode yet. Well, yeah, that's weird. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, that'd be a fun one. So I can see this being insects convert. Arthropods have legs. Yep. Arthropods get can be scute scaled and on the outside. That that hard hard shelled head, mm-hmm. that, that exoskeleton in the head, could definitely be remnants of a fully exoskeleton life. Yeah. Well, it could have done what uh, cephalopods did. Yep. And you have transitioned the shell from being external to internal. Mm-hmm. And now I'm thinking of, have you ever seen trilobite beetles? Yes. D- that This is what I'm picturing yeah. as like an ancestral mm-hmm. form. Barbara, if you if you don't know what trilobite beetles are, Google trilobite it's beetles. one of the coolest things. We'll leave it at that. But they're just awesome prehistoric looking <laughs> insects. So yeah, it's the, the exact evolutionary line is difficult with them because they are a really well done sci-fi organism very unearthly but they've been placed on earth right which then makes it like they've put more time and effort into the lifestyle of this these creatures than just about any creature in star wars so like yeah it's a real good sci-fi creature but it's hard because you've mixed different lineage attributes and there's a whole bunch of things about them that like aren't really seen in most other large, I don't want to say more complex, but, you know, more complex life forms. Like, one of the weirdest things has always been that their their, uh, uh, feeding tongues, their feeding feeder tendrils, whatever you'd call them, Mm -hmm. also have mouths that seem to be actual mouths, not just morphologically similar to a mouth. They are actual little mouths that actually react and kind of sense on their own and like there are multiple so times like where a, they sh- a symbiotic relationship yeah where it's either a symbi or like there's weird moments like that to where you have three little mouths in your throat <laughs> that come out and multiple times are shown to be like actively searching right you know force around. and it's the, the one on the left is kind of a goofball yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> kevin <laughs> uh so then so the, that that must be the big twist so the seventh movie will reveal that they're just aliens, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they've they've gone on to introduce other other graboids in other continents with their own morphology. Interesting. Uh, that are eh, I like the first three kind of four movie, yeah, the best. <laughs> huh. Well, I I'm happy to stick with a general no- notion of a early branching arthropods mm-hmm. that evolved alongside and convergently with vertebrates yep but and main- copied a lot of the same uh, attributes but maintained their overly convoluted lifestyle yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is a very arthropodian thing exactly to do. yeah it's a very invertebrate thing to do so yeah i like that 
The one note I do want to say that's always been, and I'm sure I'll say it again whenever Graboids come up. Surely. But as much as I love the movie, they always show them as pursuit predators chasing things underground. Yes. These are absolutely ambush predators. They're like bobbit worms. And like they're a bobbit worm mixed with a chameleon. Yes. Like, it's this big subterranean predator that pops out and then shoots a 12-foot tongue out at you. Yeah. Like, that's an, that's an ambush predator. Yeah. Like, well, it's it's like the conversations of uh, people, for a while in the past, people wanted to depict sauropods with trunks. Yeah. And then other people were like, but why? <laughs> you have a 20-foot neck. Yep. What do you need a trunk for? Yep. It's like, yeah, if you're a pursuit, you have all the, the, the makings of an ambush predator. And a terrifying ambush predator, but... Oh, yeah. The And the pursuit predation also is impossible because going that fast underground would be like flying through an asteroid field. Yes. Like, you're going to kill yourself. Uh, but yeah, no. Weird <laughs> animals. And fun. I love it. I love them yeah. so much. I love that they actually gave them a life cycle to work off of. That is pretty cool. And also, real quick, on the side note, bonus little note for Barbara. I don't remember her name. Mm-hmm. But the lady in the first Tremors movie, oh yes, the, the science. Mm-hmm. I think she's a grad student. Yeah, right? she's a, a, a geology geology grad student. grad student studying the seismometers. Yes, is one of my favorite movie scientists. Yeah, I love the depiction of this lady because people will be like, "What are these things?" And she says, "I don't know. I'm a geologist, <laughs> and as a scientist, I relate so hard." My favorite line <laughs> that she has is, "Why do you keep asking me?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Oh, and because uh, you also asked, uh, Barbara also asked us about, would it be able to burst into Bert's rec room? Uh, that's right. And I would say absolutely not. Like, even though it wasn't supposed to be like reinforced cinder blocks, that's still cinder blocks. Yeah. That's like, a, it's, well, and now we get into our uh, discussion of monsterification. Monsterification. <laughs> it's super strength. Super senses. Pursuit versus ambush. Pursuit versus ambush. Like, you're chasing for no reason. Yeah. Our speculative evolution, quote-unquote, real-life Graboids will be less cinematically dramatic. Well, like, uh, uh, the real-life Graboid, I think, would function much more like the Sarlacc pit from Star Wars. Like, Ooh, yeah. Where it's just sitting there and waiting next to, like, a watering hole or something. and then Or, like, a, tra- a game trail. And then every now and then... The wrong deer walks by and just gets right. into the ground. Or like the um the thing I don't know any I don't know Star Wars names, <laughs> but the asteroid worm. Yeah, it's a, exactly where yeah. it's uh it's like you are you look up it is a mouth. Yes, and <laughs> it just it pulls you into the ground and then it sits there conserving energy, growing fat. Yes, until it's ready to come aground <laughs> above ground and give birth to a whole bunch of can open mouth raptors. Yes. Hey, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, we hope you enjoyed this little uh, discussion. <laughs> As always, uh, feel free to ask us yeah. questions. Send us pitches for things in the uh, to, to discuss in the main episodes. Yeah, you get to ask us questions we can answer on, on the episode, too. That's true. Patron questions. Mm-hmm. And a huge thanks for supporting us. Yeah, no, it's it's really incredible. Like, we are always blown away uh, when... when a patron signs up at the level you have, and we appreciate it immensely. Yeah, it's I, I, I thought probably a little tacky to talk in numbers. Yeah, but I'm always surprised when people are sign up at the five dollar level. Yeah, like five dollar people, I'm like, wow, Woo! that's awesome! I thanks so much. Twenty five blows me out of the water. I, like, that, that's just so. And that's not the correct way to use that phrase. But I, th- yeah. that's how excited I am about it. I, I, it when I see a message. For one of the, like, the times it's happened, I, it's a good day for me. Like, I'm yeah. just in a good mood because that's it's just, just it's so cool. It's so generous. And it, I don't know, it, and we it, appreciate it so much. Makes me excited to podcast. Like, yeah. there are people who really, really want, and it, so thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you so much. Keep reaching out to us whenever you want. Let us know how we're doing and what we can do for you. I think that's it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks are there any me. good co- uh, uh, lines and tremors that we can sign off with? We're going to leave this long silence. I know. I'm not know, editing right? this out. There's this a, is, I had to go through a few planning. I don't well, remember my, enough of My it. first quote, <laughs> I skipped over out of reflex. It's like, well, I can't curse, but I can curse. And I've got a goddamn plan is one of my favorite <laughs> quotes in that entire movie. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye, Barbara.
Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.